Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Representative Katie Porter of California's 45th Congressional District, and I'm really excited to welcome you to our featured session, Environmental Justice and the Politics of, of Equity. I'm going to introduce our distinguished panelists here in a moment, but I want to briefly just frame up our discussion. Environmental justice is one of those phrases that gets tossed around a lot without clear definitions. Today's event is not about insisting on a definition that everyone has to follow, but in order to understand the conversation we're about to have, you should know what we mean when we say environmental justice, which you'll hear us sometimes refer to as simply EJ. We mean systematically addressing injustice and inequity in our environmental laws that disproportionately harm marginalized and vulnerable communities. That has real implications for federal policymaking, which is one of the major focuses of today's discussion. What it means is that EJ is not a single issue. Um, to use a phrase I hear a lot in Congress, it's not its own bucket. It's a way of understanding many of the issues that influence our quality of life. The way that we built highways for many decades by bulldozing the homes of families who had no political power that is an environmental justice issue. Building, licensing, operating petrochemical plants in low-income urban communities and not in wealthy suburbs, that is environmental injustice. Laying hundreds of miles of fossil fuel pipelines through communities who were never asked their opinion, that is environmental injustice. I could go on and describe how the American economy is currently structured, producing environmental injustices. An estimated 70% of contaminated waste uh, sites nationwide are located in low-income neighborhoods. Think about how much we take for granted that poverty equals pollution, and pollution equals poverty. And you have a sense of how deeply ingrained environmental injustice has become in our society. For every case that hits the headlines, there are 50 more. That is not how people should be treated, and that is not how our economy should work, and that is not how our laws should be written. In July, I wrote a piece for Teen Vogue, and I want to quote it. Too often, our elected leaders do not take action when it would provide the most health before a crisis occurs. And that is really the foundation of today's discussion, the need for Congress and governments across our country to prevent environmental catastrophes and injustices, rather than simply responding to them after the harms and the damage. We need to develop an ethic of public care in our laws, a standard of public inclusion, and a baseline of public benefit, rather than simply private profit. Our elected officials must put people, all people, before profits. The speakers you're going to hear from today are among our country's foremost leaders in championing new ways of doing business. It's my honor to introduce them now, and after we've done introductions, I'll ask each of them to say a few words of their own about their background, about how they, be, how they came to be involved in environmental justice, and about the fights that they are in right now. I'm going to start with Chair Rahul Grijalva, who I hope needs no introduction, but for those who don't know him, he has represented Southern Arizona in the House of Representatives since 2003. He is one of our greatest progressive champions in Congress, which is exactly why I am so thrilled, and we should all be so thrilled, that he chairs the House Committee on Natural Resources, where I am proud to serve alongside him. Along with Representative Donald McEachin, he is the author of the Environmental Justice for All Act, which you're going to hear more about during today's discussion. Next, Elizabeth Yampir is the executive director of UPROS, Brooklyn's oldest Latino community-based organization. She is a longtime advocate and trailblazer for community organizing around just, sustainable development, environmental justice, and community-led climate adaptation and community resiliency. Ms. Jean-Pierre was previously the Director of Legal Education and Training at the Puerto Rican Legal Defense Fund, Director of Legal Services at the American Indian Law Alliance, 
and Dean of Puerto Rican Student Affairs at Yale University. Catherine Coleman Flowers is the founder of the Center for Rural Enterprise and Environmental Justice and a vice chair of the White House's Environmental Justice Advocacy, excuse me, Environmental Justice Advisory Council. In 2019, with the Columbia University Law School Human Rights Clinic and the Institute for the Study of Human Rights, she published a landmark study, Flushed and Forgotten, Sanitation and Wastewater in Rural Communities in the United States. It's an examination of inequalities and access to sanitation with a framework of human rights. She was a 2020 MacArthur Foundation Fellow and she is one of our country's foremost advocates for economic and environmental justice in rural communities. We also have Fawn Sharp, who serves as the 23rd president of the National Congress of American Indians and vice president of the Quillot Indian Nation in Tallulah, Washington. In the keynote address at this year's Gonzaga Law Environmental Justice Symposium, she highlighted the need not only to understand the widespread impacts of climate change and pollution, but the injustices that those things make so stark in her community along the coast of the state of Washington. I think we should all remember as we start today's conversation that many Americans first became aware of environmental justice when they saw police training high pressure hoses and tear gas on unarmed water protectors fighting the Dakota Access Pipeline in freezing temperatures back in 2016. And we're very much looking forward to President Sharp's perspective. Finally, Marcy Harris is the CEO and co-founder of Popbox, an online collaborative platform that helped Chair Grijalva and his colleagues conduct an unprecedented public input campaign to draft the environmental justice for all. She serves on the boards of the People Center Internet and Launch TN and was named the one of the top 100 creative people in business by Fast Company. I also got named that, it was so cool. Um, and she has been a fellow with the Harvard Kennedy School's Ash Center for Democracy. She brings a wealth of experience as a former congressional staffer, I might even say survivor, um, and a deep understanding of how to use the internet to make political organizing and policy making more inclusive and democratic. And that is certainly a project that everyone here at Netroots supports. Thank you again for all joining us today. And I'm gonna invite each of our speakers to help the audience get to know you a little better and say a little bit about environmental justice, um, both the history and where you are going tomorrow, starting with Chair Grijalba. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Katie. I appreciate it very much. And uh, uh, Representative Porter, it's, uh, I share, uh, I think all our colleagues on the Resources Committee, your presence there has been uh, Excellent. The leadership that you bring to that subcommittee has been uh, very profound, and we're very, uh, very glad to be working with you. I, I certainly am. Uh, I, I got involved here in Tucson, uh, my hometown, and 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 the center of, of the area that of the region that I represent in Congress. Uh, I got involved because of a TCE contamination uh, that uh, that uh, polluted and poisoned the aquifer on the south side affecting 25 to 30,000 people. Who are these people? Working class, poor, elderly, and predominantly uh, Latino and indigenous. And and at first, my reaction, this is a, a civil rights issue. This is a public health issue. And and as we went forward with that, and I was working in, in the community and in, in, at a community center and doing uh, community work, uh, then it was exposed. Uh, the 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 report investigative reporter got a a Pulitzer Award for for that investigative reporting, and the correlation between the health of the people and uh, and the cancer rates and the lupus rates, particularly, and the effect on women and children, uh, that had been ignored by EPA. They said there was no correlation. Our local public health department said there was no correlation. The state health department said there was no correlation. Well, that was proven wrong with real studies. And then what happened is that the community rose up both in litigation and in other areas. And what I learned from that, what I learned from that is uh, to make the connection uh, between all the indicators of why this happened and the responsible parties, which was the Air Force, uh, 
manufacturing plants, and to some extent, the city of Tucson. And what happened at the end of the day is that there was remediation. But what happened is that people made, I and others made it the connection that, that this issue of uh, what had happened was, yes, a public health issue, but it was a, a justice issue. And it was a disparate treatment issue. It was uh, discrimination. And it was the lack of uh, attention to the, to, to, the, to the cries from those communities to do something about it. And uh, that's how I got started. And uh, that has been the core issue. From then on, you've developed connections about conservation, land use planning, uh, uh, habitats, and, uh, and it begins to, uh, it becomes a bigger picture. But environmental justice, I think, in terms of my view on the environment as a whole now, that's the seed of where where I began my uh, involvement in, in environmental issues, beginning with the justice issues that affected the place where I lived and where I grew up. Wonderful, uh, Ms. Yampier. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, uh, Elizabeth Yampier. I am the executive director of Uprose in Brooklyn. I'm also co-chair of the Climate Justice Alliance, and I'm with a statewide coalition in New York called New York Renews. Um, and part of the United Frontline Table that has been working tremendously hard to shape and influence a federal legislation um, in how it will either benefit uh, or blunt the harm that it will have on descendants of African and indigenous ancestry. I'm honored to be here today. I come from struggle. Uh, I am Puerto Rican, born and raised in New York City. Uh, just recently, my mom passed because she couldn't breathe. My father passed because he couldn't breathe. Uh, this fight for environmental justice is personal for us. And it isn't just about the disparate impact of environmental burdens on communities of color. It's also about leadership. Who speaks for who? Who sets the table? Who determines priorities? And how those are in those communities that are most impacted are invested in. I would really want to thank you, Representative Porter and Representative Grijalva, for your long history of love and dedication and commitment to our communities. I also want to say and send a shout out to our beloved Nidia uh, Velasquez uh, and to Yvette Clark and AOC who have been also uh, representatives who we think honor uh, the struggle of the front line of the climate justice struggle. Thank you. Excellent. Um, let's now go to Ms. Flowers. Yes, good morning and thank you everyone. Thank you for this invitation to be here. My name is Catherine Coleman Flowers and I hail from Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, today I'm in Madison, Alabama, which, which is where I just relocated to start the next venture as we seek uh, solutions, uh, technological solutions to wastewater problems. The way I got involved, uh, I am a native of Lyons County, Alabama, which is located between Selma and Montgomery, and people were being criminalized because of the sanitation issue. A lot of people are straight piping. In other words, when they flush their toilet, it goes out on top of the ground. And we were told initially by officials that it was because people could not afford the remedy. But then we found out that the remedy uh, is not working properly. And we found this out when we did a uh, house to house survey, which eventually led to a, uh, a study that we did with Baylor's National School of Tropical Medicine, where we found evidence of hookworm and other tropical parasites in Lowndes County, Alabama. And the people that had the highest percentage of hookworm were not the ones that uh, had septic systems that were, excuse me, they had septic systems, but they were coming back into their homes, they were failing. And that's where this environmental injustice um, and the failing technology actually meets climate change because every time it rains, people are complaining about sewage coming back into their homes. Those people were the ones that had the highest percentage of hookworm, not the ones that were straight piping because it was moving away from the house. So where we are at, at this particular point in time, my work also includes serving as vice chair of the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. And to be able to bring this rural perspective uh, to the table because oftentimes it's missed because if one have not lived in these situations, it's, it's hard to understand and explain. So we're hoping that out of this uh, come some real solutions. And I'm very appreciative of everyone that's been on the forefront of fighting for environmental justice for all of our communities, including rural communities. 
Wonderful. We'll now go to President Sharp. Um, we're glad to see you on the screen. We appreciate um, you being here. I give a little bit of an introduction to you um, as uh, you were working out your technical difficulties. So um, please speak to us about um, all of the wonderful work you're doing, including with Indigenous communities. Great. Good afternoon or good morning uh, here on the West Coast. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Congressman Grahova and uh, Congressman Porter. I am so excited to be here. For, for years, we fought just to get a seat at the table to have these conversations. So my, my work in climate change began in 2006. 15 years ago. Back then, I was a newly elected tribal leader and hearing from my community how during the lifetime of our elders, uh, they would see millions of sockeye return to the mighty Quinault River. And the year I got elected, we only had 3,000 uh, return. Uh, the following year, we had a, a December 1st storm uh, where uh, our power, our water, everything was wiped out for eight days. It was a hurricane force storm on the West Coast here in the Pacific Northwest, unprecedented. And so uh, immediately as a young elected tribal leader, I was thrust into the frontline impacts of climate change. Uh, the resource had been with uh, our families for centuries was disappearing. Uh, the ocean is encroaching and we had to relocate and we are in the process of relocating two of our villages to higher ground. That place where our ancestors signed treaties is now underwater. I took a helicopter flight into the Olympic Mountains to, to look at the uh, the glaciers that feed the mighty Quinault, and I came face to face with a mountain and found it was completely gone. It was dis it was disappeared. And so, as a young tribal leader, I was immediately confronted with the frontline impacts of climate change, and I was incredibly frustrated because back in 2006, I would try to engage in public policy conversations around climate change here at the state, in the state of Washington, congressionally, and I just could not have a substantive conversation. Uh, I would raise the issue of climate change, the room would get quiet, and then and then someone. Would would change the subject. So I went outside of the United States and I participated in the very first, uh, my first conference of party was COP14 in Poznan, Poland. And it was, it was after President Obama was elected, but before he was sworn in. And at that time, it became very clear to me that uh, we are going to have to go after those who are directly responsible for climate change. The, the public treasury is simply not enough. The scale of climate change is not going to be funded by Congress. It's not going to be funded by the state legislature. We have to price carbon and hold those who are directly responsible, accountable to pay for uh, these impacts. And way back then, we knew that the impacts of climate change were going to only intensify both in frequency and in the degree of climate impacts. And so we knew that the, the reality that we're witnessing today was, was coming and it was coming fast. And so we set out to price carbon. And if you could imagine a state like Washington with a governor like Jay Inslee, who's run a platform on climate change, as well as a governor like Christine Gregoire, who successfully went after big tobacco, they could not get climate legislation here in the state of Washington. So we went after a citizen's initiative. It was I-1631. The Western States Petroleum Association spent $33 million to kill our campaign. But this last year, we, we succeeded in the state legislature and we passed the very first comprehensive carbon pricing piece of legislation. And as we see the impacts of climate change intensify, we're, we're going to have to price carbon. And so we are setting out a model uh, to, to nationalize with tribal nations at the table and, and leading these efforts to hold big oil accountable because uh, we're simply paying for the impacts of climate change, the hurricanes, the tornadoes, the mega fires. We have to uh, get the resources from the private sector. So we are intending to not only nationalize the work that we are doing, but certainly we're, we're going to be uh, participating in, in the UN conference uh, negotiations coming up next month. Uh, but just as we price carbon, I think tribal nations are in a position to attract foreign investment uh, on renewable energy. When I was looking at pricing carbon back in 2006, there was a, a, a domestic market, but it was all voluntary through the Chicago Climate Exchange, one in California, one in New York. The price of carbon at that time was 2 to $3 a metric ton. The, the international price was $32 a metric ton, but domestic companies couldn't access those markets because the U.S. was not a signatory to the Kyoto Protocol. A tribal nation could. So that, that's just one example where a tribal nation standing on its sovereign powers and authorities can attract foreign investment where these uh, renewable yeah. energy things are, are valuable. Uh, internationally. So 
tribal nations are in a position not only to advance public policy to price carbon, we're also in a position for that, that new and emerging uh, uh, economy that we see on the horizon. So tribal nations are, are here. We're on the front lines being impacted. We're on the front lines of successfully holding big oil accountable. And we are on the front lines of seeing that, that bright future that we all see comes to fruition here in the United States. See you, Quail. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we're gonna go now to Marcy. Thank you so much. And and just to be very quick, I, I thank you both Representative Porter and Representative Grijalva. So honored to be on this panel with these distinguished speakers. Uh, I, uh, as, as you said, Representative nice Porter, I'm a, a former congressional staffer, surviving congressional staffer, forever congressional staffer. Uh, that experience was during uh, the, the health reform push where I met a lot of the folks here at Net Networks Nation. Uh, and my co-founders and I, uh, started in 2010 trying to build a platform that would lower barriers to entry, open up access to the advocacy process. We had a lot of uh, idealism about the potential for technology in that process. We've had ups and downs on that idealism cycle over the years, but I'll just say that for my co-founder Roshna Chowdhury and I, this experience working with the Natural Resources Committee and the working group for uh, this public participatory process for the EJ bill has been the most inspirational experience we've had in over 10 years of this work. Uh, and so I'm excited to talk about it. Our reporter did, did the, do the handoff too soon. <laughs> I, I think uh, uh, Representative Porter may be having some connection issues. Um, so if uh, someone else wants to go ahead and uh, handle a question or two, we can do that. I feel like we may have lost her. <clears throat> yeah, Representative Porter seems to be having some connection issues. Um, so if um, someone wants to handle a question or two until we can get her back, why don't we do that? Well, there was a question that was raised. I actually didn't talk about the accomplishments and the work done by my organization, Uprose of CJA, but I would invite you to go on the website and, and check that out. Um, I think there was a question that I think is really important about the Build Back uh, Better Act um, and, uh, and the position of the environmental justice movement on that. I don't know, now that Representative Porter's back on, maybe I should just sit back and let you and let you speak, and I'm happy to address that later. Uh, how do we um, want to do this? Absolutely. Sorry about that. Um, I wanted to um, actually go to you first um, and ask you about how do you think that the political and policy landscape around environmental justice has changed over time? You have been in this fight. You have been a leader in this fight for many years. How are frontline communities kind of engaging on environmental justice policy, um, particularly at the federal level or at the national level, working in cooperation compared to when you started? Well, I think it's I think everything's changed from when I started uh, back in the late 90s uh, when I started doing this work. And we were at that time fighting against the unfair siting of environmental burdens in our communities and then sort of uh, pivoted to planning uh, and changing the landscape, stopping the siting of power plants, uh, passing legislation, uh, even just recently in New York State with New York Renews passing this, the, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, uh, the, the legislation that that the, that the federal government used to model Justice 40 after. So everything's changed. We have got the Climate Justice Alliance, which is really sort of the center of gravity on the nexus between climate change and racial justice and a move towards a just transition. Um, and what we used to see was grass top organizations determining what our priorities were with their fingerprints all over every piece of legislation. And now you're seeing the United Frontline Table, which is made up of CJA, IEN, you know, the Indigenous Environmental Network, the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, Black Lives Matter, and a number of grassroots organizations all over the country, literally hundreds uh, that represent millions of people in the United States. 
And so we feel and felt for a while that we were shaping the landscape and we were changing policy. We certainly have been really successful in the state of New York. Uh, but recently we've been very disappointed and we've been disappointed because it's black indigenous people of color who voted Biden into office. Um, he wouldn't have gotten into office if it had not been uh, because of the work that was done by people on the ground in our communities. And he even said, you know, that black people have always had his back, right? Um, and and so what we're seeing right now is appointments like with people like Gina McCarthy and Al Zaid really sort of playing three card Monty with the lives of black and indigenous people who've been hustled for generations. And so the justice, so when we talk about the bipartisan infrastructure package and Build Back Better, um, Be Better Act, we think it's in conflict with the environmental justice principles. The Justice 40 pledge has become sort of a climate version of 40 acres and a mule, a, a promise that will not be met uh, in the infrastructure prep packages. Frontline communities have promised 40% of funding to be earmarked for projects to build safer and stronger communities in order to confront the climate emergency. And we already see a structure being set up that would allow for the funding to be used as benefits and not direct funding. And these so-called benefits could take the form of harmful programs and some that should have happened anyway. Um, so that we're also seeing fossil fuel subsidies that are included in both packages. The bipartisan infrastructure bill has 25 billion slated for new fossil fuel subsidies in addition to the Build Back Better Act, which also includes an additional 15 billion. Um, this doesn't even include the subsidies for fake clean energy in the CE. PP. So, so we are really concerned about the false solutions that are funded in both packages, uh, and we are working diligently both on the ground. Um, and it isn't just about putting together legislation on the federal level. We literally are operationalizing a just transition. You're seeing that in New York, where we launched the first community-owned solar cooperative uh, in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, where we're bringing offshore wind and working closely with NYSERDA, which is the equivalent of the U.S. Department of Energy, to bring in investments for offshore wind. We are solution oriented and there should be an investment in those solutions. Um, so I think there is tremendous dissatisfaction from grassroots leaders uh, who have been working um, leaderfully. I mean, we are a leaderful intergenerational movement uh, and we have been shaping everything from the Thrive Act to the Green New Deal. That is radically different than it has been in the past. We are leading uh, and we have to because it is literally our people that are on the chopping uh, on the chopping board, uh, our people who are, uh, you know, we've seen that from Hurricane Maria, from Superstorm Sandy, Hurricane Ida, we can go on and on about the devastation that has impacted those people least responsible for creating climate change. And so we're going to expect leadership um, and we're going to expect that leadership follows the front line and is aligned with the recommendations on policy that we have been pushing forward. It is a different moment. It's a different time and literally everything is at stake. Um, so that that has changed substantially. Um, well, I wanted to go now to Chair Grijalva and talk a little bit um, about the approach that you took um, to develop the Environmental Justice for All Act, um, which is certainly quite was developed in quite a different way than the bipartisan infrastructure bill, to your point, um, Elizabeth. Um, can you talk a little bit about why you took such a different approach in developing environmental justice for all and how that shaped where, what the bill looks like now? I, I, the legislation is, is a product of a process that uh, that, that we learned uh, we learned the hard way. Uh, you know, the efforts around environmental justice legislation, at least for myself and others, began in the uh, for me in the 2015 uh, uh, Congress, and it, was, it had no traction, and uh, you know. Uh, I think when we started the process to, to do something not only comprehensive around environmental justice, we also, no matter what we wrote, if we did not have the, the investment, the involvement, and the real uh, say by uh, organizations, frontline communities, and environmental justice uh, leadership in the, in the process, it wasn't going to work. It wasn't going to work. It would not have uh, the, the the support that it needs to have to become legislation. So we started a different way. And uh, my friend, Ms. Harris, is, can talk about how how uh, Popbox was so critical in that process. Uh, we had a summit, uh, about 300 people from across the country came to DC and we wrote it 
with the, with the task force and t took it back time and time again for comment, for criticism, for critique, for changes. About 300 came in. And at the end of the day, the product was a reflection of that process. And, it, and it's a good uh, barometer and, and, a, and a good example for, to use in other pieces of legislation. And we were addressing systemic issues in our society, racism and discrimination. We were uh, environmental uh, equity issues and the issue of empowerment uh, in, in terms of communities uh, that my colleagues were speaking to. That, that, that's the legislation. And it codifies into law some very fundamental things cumulative effect and redress uh, and, uh, and how communities can uh, go to, to court, go judicial and otherwise to, uh, to assert their right to participate and their right to be heard. Uh, and and uh, that's, that's the law. And it was developed not from the bottom up, but it was, a, it was an organic issue that lent support to it. And myself and my good friend, Mr. McKeachin, uh, uh, followed this through for two, almost two years, and that's the product. And I think it still needs to be codified into law. Uh, the uncertainty of what will happen with Justice 40, the uncertainty as what will be parts of the Environmental Justice for All Act that becomes law and doesn't become law. Uh, I, I still think that for the sake of the long term in the communities that we are purporting to, to, to want to empower, uh, that needs to be codified into law. And that's where the resistance is going to be very strong on those two issues, cumulative effect and redress. And that's where the industry is going to come hard uh, to try to stop those two issues. And if those are taken out, then essentially you've taken out the power of communities to be able to, uh, yes. uh, to be heard and to be there. Elizabeth, did you just want to follow up on that real quickly? And then I'll try, I want to turn to Marcy. Sure, just quickly, I, I just want to say that what Representative Grijalva, I always have trouble saying your name, I'm so sorry about that, has done is really a model, is really a model and so contrary to what we're seeing right now at the national level. It is uh, both the process uh, in terms of how uh, communities were meaningfully engaged in decision making, which is so necessary at this time, but also the outcomes. Um, you know, the process is just as important as the outcome. And I think that what he did is something that needs to to be replicated and models how we should be moving forward collectively. So I just wanted to flag that because I went into the problems without talking about that the fact is that we are working with people who know what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. So thank you for um, that. Mar awesome. Marcy, um, tell us a little bit more about what Popbox did. You put a link into the chat um, so people can read a little bit about that. Um, you know, it's been really central, I think, to what yes. um, the outcome of the legislation was able to be. Um, and how can we be thinking and how can other environmental justice advocates joining us today be thinking about using Popbox or other kinds of technology to, to really become more inclusive and to deliver justice in both the de democratic process and in the outcome? Well, thank you so much. And I absolutely echo what Elizabeth said. This was a groundbreaking process. And I, I'll be very honest, it was not groundbreaking because of the technology. It was groundbreaking because there were lawmakers ready to listen and ready to take what they heard and incorporate into uh, the the legislation that was being drafted. So uh, if, if folks follow the, the description of the process, it, uh, the committee underwent this uh, convening that Representative Grijalva described. There was a request for input before a bill had even been drafted. I, I tell folks they were asking about the ingredients before they put it into the recipe, you know, before they even uh, created the recipe. Most of the time folks get uh, asked to participate once the cake is baked. Uh, and uh, then there, there was a, a process with the draft bill where uh, organizations and, and members of the working group, individuals were invited to come and comment in line on the actual language. Uh, and then that input was incorporated into the bill. And I know because I went and sat down with the staff and they showed me their dog-eared highlighted list of all the comments they had received and how they were checking off what had been included. It was really just the the most, uh, I think, groundbreaking process I have seen in the US Congress after many years of watching uh, to include the public in 
uh, the process, le legitimately incorporating the feedback into uh, the the eventual legislation. And as as we all know, there's no requirement that Congress does that. There's a requirement in the executive branch for a consultation public comment process. That doesn't exist in Congress. It's a decision by uh, the committee and those who are drafting uh, to actually affirmatively uh, uh, request and incorporate that kind of participation. So I've talked about it all over the world. I went to the World Forum and Democracy and talked about it. I talked to the Interparliamentary Union about it. Uh, the House Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress included it in their recommendations as something that other committees should replicate. So again, uh, I would just emphasize that this, this really was groundbreaking and the key was lawmakers on the other side listening and ready to incorporate what they heard. Wonderful. Um, I'm already, my mind's already spinning with different ways that I can begin to to use things like that. Um, I'm a big fan. I just talked to Chirga Hall today about having a field hearing, which has been sort of the, the very old school um, kind of version of getting community input. But um, the ways that you did it with um, with Popbox really were, were allowed for much more follow-up and much more continued engagement. Um, people weren't heard once. They were kind of able to work together and collaborate. And it's really terrific. Um, Ms. Flowers, I know that you, um, in your introduction, I told everyone that you are vice chair of the Biden Biden Harris administration's White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the parallels um, between that approach um, and sort of what's been going on with grassroots activists that was just described? And how is the administration working to develop its environmental justice regulations and policy? Okay, I will start off my comments by saying that I cannot speak officially for the WEJAC, but I can attempt to answer the question as a member of the WEJAC and a private citizen. So everyone that serves on the WEJAC, we represent various organizations from around the country. And a lot of the people that have been appointed or people that I've known for many, many years that have been actively engaged in environmental justice fights in their particular communities around the United States. Uh, and, and I wanna give just a little bit of a history. Um, many years, well, during the, the, the election when it was determined that Biden was going to be uh, the candidate, uh, I became part of the Biden-Sanders Unity Task Force. I was appointed there and I got a chance to serve with numerous people that included AOC and also Representative McEachin. And part of what I was asked to do was to help to draft the EJ policies for the administration. And I received um, advice from various people from around the country about how to move forward uh, with that. And a lot of what was suggested ended up becoming part of the uh, ended up becoming part of the Biden White House, uh, and I believe that. And, and one of those, of course, was was also the WeJack. And I uh, feel fortunate being from Lowndes County, Alabama, a place that very few people know about, but historically has has a key role in the in the, the voting rights movement. Uh, and, and coming from a rural community uh, where we just celebrated uh, the first uh, the first person to become part of the NBA Hall of Fame uh, that came from an HBCU and was undrafted, Ben Wallace. And he talked about, you know, the, the struggle. And part of that is being part of the WeJack. Uh, first of all, for him being recognized by the NBA Hall of Fame is significant. But also, I think for someone like me to be sitting on the WeJack is also significant because there have been times I've been in this fight for well over 25 years, and I have not uh, ever been able to penetrate uh, that level of government in terms of talking about the issues that we have in a place like Lowndes County. And oftentimes uh, is, is missed out because people just assume that the sanitation issues are issues that have been resolved. Uh, the people that serve on the WeJack, we're dealing with uh, writing interim guidance for an example for Justice 40. Uh, we're also working on an EJ and climate justice screening tool. We're working on a, and we take public comments. I mean, the public can be engaged in the process and we do listen and I encourage people when they contact us to also a, attend the, the meetings that uh, is posted on the website where we can do it virtually and be able to have some input. And those, I can tell you and assure you that those comments are definitely listened to. Uh, by members of the WeJack. We have people on the um, 
uh, on the WeJack representing places uh, like Puerto Rico, Alaska, Arizona. We have indigenous people. We have uh, Latinos uh, representing folk. We have uh, people from Appalachia. I mean, it's probably one of the most diverse groups. And, and one of the things about it is not a perfect process because it's the first time we've ever engaged in the process. There's never been a process like this before, but a lot of it grows out of and complements the work that you're doing there in Congress. And we're happy for that because as has already been stated, until uh, we codify what we were talking about as it relates to environmental justice, we'll continue to have to fight these battles and we don't wanna fight it if the next president is an anti-justice president. And we have to put this in process so that we won't keep revisiting the cancer alleys and the people living with raw sewage over and over again for years to come. Wonderful. We have a great uh, conversation going um, in the chat and we're going to start taking some audience questions. So if you have things that you'd like to ask the panelists, um, please type them in there. Um, I wanted to start with a question um, from uh, Kristen, um, who asked about COVID um, as an environmental justice issue. She points out correctly um, that COVID hit Black people of color, um, Indigenous people um, first and hardest. New diseases sometimes emerge from environmental destruction. Um, can you share any thoughts on COVID as an environmental justice issue? And I think we'll go first to Catherine and then uh, to President Sharp. Yes, uh, thank you. COVID has, has really devastated my community in Lowndes County. At one point, Lowndes County uh, had the highest COVID infection and death rate in the state of Alabama. Even, even people that were activists like Pamela Rush, who had worked with me uh, for years to try to bring justice, not only as it relates to the sanitation issue, but about poverty and inequality of, in terms of access to, to economic opportunity. Uh, she died of COVID last year in July and, and left two children orphan as a result. So it has, uh, I, I think that people that are in, well, we've seen that people that are hit the hardest are the people that have the, been the most <laughs> overburdened and under-resourced communities. It's the same communities we, all of us are talking about. And, and consequently, especially in rural communities that have no hospitals. And Pamela had to be taken to Selma uh, which was about maybe 45 minutes away from where she lived and then transported from Selma to Birmingham, which was two hours away to get treatment, to be placed on a ventilator where she eventually passed away. So, but along with that, she was dealing with diabetes. Her home was full of mold, full of mold and mildew. She had, her, her daughter had asthma and was sleeping with a CPAP machine. These are the kinds of things that make people even more vulnerable. Then, then I, when I talk to my friends that are in Cancer Alley, that are living around those petrochemical plants, that when I even go there to visit, I have to deal with respiratory issues once I leave. And I can just imagine how it could be for people that's living with it all the time. And then with, with diseases like COVID being uh, creating respiratory problems, it, it only compounds the issues and make them less likely to be able to fight it off. So just based on my personal experience, I believe that we have to address these environmental justice issues. So as these diseases become more common with climate change, we, we have to be in a position to fight and we're fighting on that front as well. Um, President Sharp. Yes, yeah, well, thank you for the question. There really is a, a connection. And our ancestors long foretold of a day of reckoning, a moment of truth. And when you look at the multiple apocalyptic challenges that our generation is facing, whether it's climate change, whether it's dealing with multiple global pandemics, uh, over the course of our lifetime, it's, it's quite evident that we are a world that is detached from uh, our, our basic principles of indigenous teachings that we have to have, live in a balanced environment. And we are experiencing the brunt of it. When you, when you look at the stories coming out of the Navajo Nation, we have the highest rates of infection, the highest rates of death. Uh, and we are, are very vulnerable and we're vulnerable because we do not have the resources. Uh, there was a report by the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights to Congress detailing, it's called the Broken Promises Report, and not one agency is living up to its trust responsibility to tribal nations. Fortunately, we have 
friends and champions in Congress that are working to correct that. But until communities of color actually have the resources, we're going to remain vulnerable. We're going to be re uh, remaining on the front lines of the impacts of climate change, but global pandemics. And uh, if we follow our teachings and the teachings of our ancestors to reconcile the way we live with those traditional values that are designed uh, to ensure that we survive for the next seven generations, that's the path forward. And so I'm, I'm very grateful for these type of conversations. I'm grateful for the leadership that allows and creates multiple points of entry for our voices to be heard because we are all impacted and we all have a, a solution. Thank you. Yeah, no, and I think the connection between communities that have been under-resourced um, really for the entirety of our country's history in terms of health care, um, both the quality of care and the affordability of care, um, and the connection to the, the greater environmental harms and, and illnesses that they deal with is, is an important one. Um, I wanted to take a question um, uh, about from Adam um, about uh, pollution being sort of concentrated in environmental justice communities, as we've been talking about. Um, and I wanted to ask Representative Grijalva if you could say a little bit more about um, how environmental justice legislation is tackling the issue of cumulative impacts, which is something that I know um, Elizabeth Young here mentioned as well. Do you want it? Is it my turn? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Thank, thank you. Uh, I mentioned two issues that are central to, to the legislation. You know, there's another point that, that a part of the empowerment is the resource question that you brought up, uh, Katie, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a salient and important point. The support in grants and others in the legislation because communities have to have the independent ability to bring in expertise to do organizing around an issue and to be able to deal with plans and options that are presented to them. And, and uh, that resource support, uh, I think is key to that. Uh, the other issue is uh, cumulative effect. Uh, the way the situation is set up right now, we're dealing with in Cancer Alley, we're dealing, or, in a, or the plastics plant, we're dealing with just this emission that is permitted. And, uh, but, and that's it. And then the findings will come back saying, oh, by the way, it's below some uh, level and it's really not that big of a harm. But what we're saying is, yes, you, you do the analysis on this, but you also do the cumulative analysis of all other 40 plants that happen to be in that same quarter and what the cumulative effect of those emissions, those discharges are on, on people. And that's key. And, and I think that changes the whole conversation and uh, for communities to be able to deal with the question of what is uh, being cited and what is being planned. The, so cumulative you know, effect Elizabeth? is key. Oh, is there any follow up on that? Sorry, Chair. Sure, sure. I, 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 think it's, uh, I think it's really important that the conversation about cumulative impact uh, follow the conversation about COVID. Um, you, you know, you saw in New York City, which is a densely populated community where thousands and thousands and thousands of people died. And even as we speak just a few blocks away from me, uh, there are four refrigerated trucks with a, oh, about 500 bodies that have been there since COVID took effect. Um, you know, uh, a year and a half ago. And in my own family, I lost four members in within two weeks. And so it wasn't surprising to us that it was going to be those communities that are surrounded by power plants, uh, petrochemical industries, waste transfer stations were going to be the ones that were going to be the hardest hit. Um, but we can't talk about cumulative impact and we can't talk about reducing emissions and the air monitoring that needs to happen and, um, and, and, the, and the kinds of reductions that need to happen in order to help our communities uh, without talking about taking out fossil fuel industries, uh, taking peaker plants that exist in our communities uh, and replacing them with either battery storage or renewable energy. What these things, these conversations have to happen in tandem with each other. It's not enough, for example, for the administration to say, okay, I'm going to give you Justice 40, uh, but with the other hand, I'm going to give you um, false solutions. Uh, it's literally giving with one hand and taking away with the other. Uh, and so the conversation 
conversation about cumulative impact and the discriminatory citing of environmental burdens in our community specifically, because we have been targeted for environmental burdens. Uh, that has been intentional, the idea that our communities don't have the power or the resources to fight back. So yes, there has to be investments to level the playing field and to create healthy communities in, our, in, 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 in every part of the United States, but there also has to be consistency uh, from the federal administration on how we're going to ad uh, address a legacy of harm that has been hoisted on people who have endured a legacy of austerity and neglect. Um, so, uh, so it's a complicated question, but there are answers and the front line of the climate crisis has those answers. And so I really hope that this conversation uh, promotes a uh, deeper conversation about how we get there collectively. Yeah, well, I'm gonna I think one more question. I, I ask that we keep it short so we can make sure we get to it. Um, Dan Jacoby asks, um, how would the environmental justice movement gain more momentum um, if we engage more with farmers and with agriculture, we know that they're, you know, they're, they're seeing crop loss and topsoil loss. Um, Catherine, you know, within your work with rural communities, um, often we think about sometimes there being a tension between um, agriculture and the environmental justice movement. Can you say just a couple words about that and then we'll move to closing thoughts? Yes, uh, briefly, I think there's a difference between the factory farms and the small family farmers. And I think that distinction should be made. And I think we should do more to help uh, the, 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 the family farms and the small farmers and the black farmers than what we've been doing. And I think by doing that and making sure that food is locally sourced, uh, that that will lead to some of the types of, of, of help that we need, not only just with climate and environmental justice issues, because a lot of these places are deprived of food. And, and we can, like in Alabama, we can grow food, but we don't grow food because there was a legacy of, of, uh, of paying farmers not to grow food. We need to change that. But they were given a lot of the, the incentives to the, to the factory farmers and we need to move away from factory farming. So I don't think that there's a natural tension. I think that what we have to do is shift the resources to where they need to be. And then I think things will be more in balance and, and that's also a justice issue. Well, as we wrap up, um, if everybody could just say, you know, 30, 45 seconds really quick um, if, of your last remarks, I'd love you to kind of in 30 seconds answer this question. How can we push organizations that are not focused on environmental justice, who don't see this issue and the connection of it to their work, how can we push them to be more environmental justice minded? Um, and let's start um, with uh, Marcy. Well, I, we steer a, a bit clear of the policy questions, but I would just say, I just just recall that when uh, uh, Representative Grahalva and McEachin reached out, the first thing they told me is, we have to do things differently for environmental justice because a core principle for environmental justice is that no one speaks for the communities, the communities speak for themselves. And I think what this process has illustrated is how beneficial and important that is and how that's not just an environmental justice principle. That is a principle for absolutely every area of policy. And I think there's so much to be learned uh, from the people in this discussion and, and uh, what has been demonstrated by the committee. Uh, President Sharp. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I would suggest we uh, connect by leading by example and, and building on the momentum. We find leaders in every sector and we're running out of time. And I think it's just so critically important for those of us that have the passion, that have the work, that we come together in venues like this, lead by example, and they'll come along eventually. Uh, but we just have to maintain the momentum. Excellent. Um, uh, Elizabeth? You know, I think that this is a moment for us to re to think about building just relationships and engage in self transformation. This is a moment where um, the future is, looks dire, uh, and we have to build alignment. We have to move money uh, to the front line of the climate crisis, and we need to be able to support those solutions and invest in those solutions that are coming from all of our communities across the country. Whether it's Appalachia, whether it's our people in Indian country, whether it's Detroit or the Gulf South, we are we are literally going to be the majority 
party by 2042 when climate change has fully taken hold. And so this investing in our communities is investing in our future. And so I think that we're going to have to have some hard and messy conversations about what our core values are. And we have to be centered on racial justice and equity. Literally, it has been a legacy of ignoring that uh, because it's an uncomfortable conversation. And the only thing more uncomfortable than the conversation is climate change. It is disruptive and is it is going to basically have its way with us. So I think we have an opportunity right now to start doing the work that needs to be done and supporting the people that are leading these solutions. But thank you for the opportunity to join and be in community with all of you. I'm really honored to have been here today. Uh, Catherine, really briefly, and then Chair Grijalva. Uh, yes, uh, I think that the way we keep this momentum up is to have those hard conversations. Uh, coming from a red state and surrounded by people whose sometimes value systems, political values do not align with mine, but I have to still have those conversations with them. And I think we have to have those conversations across all, all spectrums, uh, whether it's religious, uh, whether it's political, uh, we have to find alignment so we can move together because if we don't, we're gonna all end up being destroyed together if we don't confront climate change. Environmental justice is not is not a singular silo. It, 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 the comprehensive nature of it is that it it, it affects the quality of life in many and it, in, in, in all communities. It is about uh, it is about equity. It is about uh, an, uh, a strategy to deal with systemic racism and neglect. It is about uh, uh, civil rights and, and and the protection of all individuals. And it is it and it is about the environment and climate issues and environmental issues around the feet around the issue of equity and justice. That's what the environmental justice bill is. And I think I think we have to talk about it in 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 the expansive way. That it's not just about those people. That it is about everyone. And as we and, and dealing with the environmental justice issue is is not just an equity issue. It is a vital economic issue that people have yes. to come to grips with. We have to have a mindset that this is not this is not something we're doing to appease, but something to fundamentally change the dynamics of how uh, in, uh, uh, environmental uh, issues are dealt with. And and I think the legislation does that. You know, we have calls from Chair Maloney in New York on the Peaker issue wants to have uh, the uh, us come by and deal with the issue of cumulative effect. And, and you know, once even those doors begin to get open about what cumulative effect is, that is an opportunity for us to go in there and make our argument. And I think we have to make our argument and we have to be inclusive. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that is a perfect note to end on. Everybody, as Chair Grijalva says, environmental justice is an issue um, that each of us needs to be raising, lifting up, um, learning um, about, and, and making those connections. And it's really a framework that we can use to push forward to address um, all of the different things that the Chair mentioned. Racial equity, um, pollution, protective of species, respect for indigenous cultures and peoples. Um, so thank you everyone so much for joining, for being part of this conversation. We have a great schedule left remaining here at Network. So I want to make sure everybody can get on to that. Please join me in thanking our incredible panelists for sharing their thoughts. And I, I'm really believing us forward you. in this fight. Yes. Thank you, Katie. Thank you.